morning, everyone. It's a beautiful family you have, PJ, and I'm grateful to be uh, just a part of what God's doing in your family, in your extended family. It's great. Congratulations. Bring those, bring those babies up so that they love God. Create an atmosphere where they can love God and follow Jesus, right? It's good stuff. Well, today, here we go. We are going to wrap up the Be Normal series, and uh, we're wrapping it, up, wrapping it up with a message called Order Your Home, and uh, there's a particular order that God has ordained uh, for our homes. It is not, our homes are not a place where it's a free-for-all, where everybody gets to choose according to their whims how things should be. God has ordained a particular order for our homes. Now, a free-for-all in some settings is just fine, but it's not really in our homes. A free-for-all by definition means there's disorganization. A free-for-all by definition means that there's an, it's an unrestricted situation or event where everybody kind of is involved in however or whatever they want to be involved in. And it's one thing to see a, or hear a dictionary definition of what a free-for-all is, but it might be better to see what it actually looks like. So I want you to pay attention to this short video. I said, are you ready? Come on! In three, two, one, go! Now, if as you watched that, it made you think of life in your home, then this message is for you. <laughs> and my guess is you'll be able to make some application. As I said, we're concluding Be Normal this morning, and we're going to take up this, this subject of the home. I think it's a very important uh, theme, a very important subject that I can't imagine that each and every one of us would find some way of making some application. I know that Many here are already followers of Christ and others are not, but all of us hopefully will approach this with an open heart and an open mind and consider where we might be able to order our homes in a different way than maybe it's going right now. Because as I said, and as the scriptures will study this morning bear out, there is a particular order that God has ordained for our homes and it is not a free-for-all to be made up according to our whims. The scriptures inform us of the proper structures and relationships in our homes, how they are supposed to be, and it is to our benefit to order our homes accordingly. Now, what we're going to talk about today are not, as some would think, outdated values from a bygone era. They are rather tried and true ideals that God calls people to aspire toward. These are not put in place to keep people from being happy and living free. In fact, they're precisely why they're put in place, that we might be happy and live free. To fight against them would be, at some point, to fight against God himself and, of course, the end of that would prove detrimental to one's own well-being. So it seems, friends, that our culture, the culture that we're all saturated in, is bent on eradicating all forms of limits and boundaries from the human experience. The hope there, it seems, as we would try to study our culture, would be that, they, that, it, that the, the, the hope is to, to eliminate all of these any sort of boundaries, anything that would be considered traditional, any sort of limitation, so as to enthrone our base human desires as Lord of everything. History, though, proves that when humans strive to live that way, they self-destruct. Their souls begin to disintegrate and society itself comes down. 
So education and technology, as wonderful as those things are, they will not save us from that. So let's talk about what it looks like to order our homes. Our big idea this morning is real simple. An ordered home is normal for the Christ follower. And as I said, this this message is pointed toward one who is a follower of Christ, but it is also applicable to anybody who is a human being, which I think all of us qualify. Maybe not everybody online, but I think everybody present qualifies. Meaning they might be having their pets sit with them while they're watching. I wasn't trying to be derogatory toward anyone. (laughs) Come on. Now remember, in this series, Be Normal, when I use the word normal, I mean healthy, not common. The free-for-all is actually what is common. But we're seeing the fruit of that in our society. So let's read what it means to be normal with regard to our homes. And I want to remind you that several weeks ago, our text today starts in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. But I want to remind you that a few weeks ago, we actually went through verse 12 through 17. And by way of a quick summary, if you remember that, we were, we were called as God's chosen ones who, have, who are holy and dearly loved by God, we are called to put on such traits to develop cert- certain attributes like compassionate hearts and humility and kindness and meekness and to put on love and to bear with one another and to forgive one another and to allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts in the midst of our relationships and to let the and to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly in this context of community, both within our homes as well as the larger community of the family of God or the church. And we're to be thankful. And we're told in verse 17 that whatever we do, whether in word or in deed, we're to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as if Jesus himself were authorizing us to do such things, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then our text today says... Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, the relationships that our text lays out and addresses are wives to husbands and husbands to wives, children to parents and parents to children. And in this context, in this, as, as this letter was written in the first century, bond servants and masters is listed, masters and bond servants, and our probably closest equival, equivalent to that in our day would be that of employment. So we can categorize these relationships really simply. There's marriage, there's family, and there's employment. Now, originally I thought in my aspiration to take all of this text, verse 18 of chapter 3 through verse 1 of chapter 4, but as I got into it and began to realize the content of what is here, I realized that something's got to give, There's no way for me to be able to give a full exposition of the text as a whole in a single setting. So I've taken the chapter 3, verse 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. I've set that aside. We'll we'll go through that in another day so as to take up the the, 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 the pressing relationships of marriage and family. Now, it's understandable, friends, that some people flinch when they hear words like submission and obedience. Some flinch because they have suffered wrongly 
because others have misunderstood what it means and have applied it in a way that is quite selfish. And for that, what do you say? A sincere apology is hardly enough. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the pain and the trauma of that, maybe even the scars of that are still very real in your soul. But if I may, we have to understand that the wrong application of biblical ideals does not negate the command. Simply because somebody misused that principle does not mean we do away with the principle. Rather, we strive to get it right in humility, with compassionate hearts and kindness and meekness and patience and love. That would honor God and would be his good direction for us. Others flinch at the mention of words like submission and obedience because the reality is they're just simply not interested in submitting to or being obedient to anyone. They are rebels at heart. And if that is you, then the counsel of Obi-Wan Kenobi would be fitting. After this sermon, you should go home and rethink your life. (laughs) And I kind of mean that, right? As we dive into this passage, we need to first make some big picture observations. And we can do that by paying attention. We're talking about ordering the home. We need to pay attention to the order in which the story is told. These topics are addressed in a particular order, and that is not random or accidental. In the big picture, the household as a whole is ordered. And this text deals with relationships, as we can see, as a household in its fullest sense. There's husbands, there's wives, and there's children. And many of you are in households where that's not the fullest sense. Maybe you're a widow or a widower. Maybe you're a single parent, so there are children, but there's not a spouse. Maybe you're a newly married couple, and there's a husband and there's a wife, but there's no children yet. So if your home is one in which there is not the fullest sense, it does not mean none of it matters. We have to strive to practice the principles where they're applicable and put the rest of it away for there may be a someday where we can actually apply them. So the household as a whole is ordered, and we see this just in the big picture in which the text is told. What we find first is that all members are equally valued in this household. What we, need, what we need to notice, in keeping with the context here, is that wives, children, and bond servants are addressed first. That's not accidental. That is, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, making a revolutionary statement in this first century context. This first century culture, like so much of what was in those kind of days of antiquity, in that culture, the men and the fathers and the masters were prevalent. So here comes the message of Jesus Christ who elevates the value of children, who elevates the value of women within the culture and revolutionizes that culture over time. And we see this by addressing the wives and the children and the bond servants first. The apostle is communicating their value and their importance, that they're equal members of the Christian household. Friends, in the day, it was revolutionary. There's distinct roles as we can see, but there's equal value. The second thing we notice in the big picture is that marriage comes before children. That's not accidental, friends. And there's two angles that we can look at this from. The first would be that a marriage covenant is supposed to be in place before sexual activity and the production of children. When I was a kid on the playground, there was a song that people would sing. It would go something like this. Brent and Jesse sitting in a tree. Why they were sitting in a tree, we don't know know why. (laughs) K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Sing it with me. First comes love, then comes marriage, 
then comes the baby in the baby carriage. That wasn't just a fun way to tease a boy and a girl that liked each other, friends. It was a way of communicating what was normal. It was a cultural aspect in a more traditional setting that America used to be like that communicated a biblical value. And we see it right here. Marriage is listed before children, and that's not accidental. That is not just an old-fashioned traditional thing. It is God's prescription for our homes. The second angle that we can see from this of marriage coming before children is that the husband-wife relationship comes before the parent-child relationship. And that, friends, is revolutionary in our day where marriage is being devalued over and again and children are being elevated to literal thrones wherein they become the center of all things and nearly are worshipped as idols within our homes. That is not what's supposed to happen. Again, it is not accidental that the marriage is listed before the children. The oneness that marriage creates does not and must not get trumped by the existence of children. In order of priority, your marriage comes before your children. And there are a number of reasons why that is that we don't have time to deal with this morning, but it is a definitive statement coming right out of Scripture. The third thing that we recognize in the household as a whole being ordered is that the family is prioritized over work. This means that a person cannot, must not, neglect their family for the sake of their career. One's spouse and their children are more valuable than their career. And to keep the latter But to lose the former would be a true loss indeed. Again, the order here is it matters, friends. These are the things that we notice by observing the big picture. Now we've got to dig into the verses and we find two things. We we see the two pillars of marriage that that must be in place and the two virtues of family that must be esteemed. Let's first talk about marriage, the two pillars of marriage needing to be in place. And as we do that, we have to give some general principles so that we understand once we get into the verses, the context in which we're we're studying these. So these general principles are several. The first is that these verses are addressing a biblical marriage A biblical marriage is defined as a covenant relationship with God between a man and a woman for a lifetime. That is how the Bible defines marriage. So any relationship that does not strictly adhere to that definition isn't a marriage recognized by heaven, even if it's thought to be legal on earth. Now, I know that what I just said is highly offensive to huge swaths of our society. I don't say that arrogantly or, or overly bluntly, but it is my job to say what the Bible says. And if I refuse to say what the Bible says, I should resign and find something else to do with my life. I recognize that there are many who don't even, don't even have any sort of context to understand what a biblical marriage is. They've not seen it in their own lives through their parents or grandparents. All they hear is the narrative of a society that has strictly, has strictly uh, 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 desired and pursued the evacuation of everything that could possibly be thought tied to a divine one true God. So these verses are addressing a biblical marriage. So when we talk about husbands and wives, it has to be in that context, a man and a woman for a lifetime. The second thing that we see in these general principles, letter B, is that these verses are specific to a husband and a wife. Understand, it does not say that women in general are commanded to submit to men. It doesn't say that at all, 
and in fact, not in this verse or any other verse in the entire Bible, women are not commanded to submit to men. Any more that in general, men are commanded to love all women. See how stupid that sounds? But we, we got to keep the whole thing together, right? You can't claim the one with, and then reject the other. If it's wives to their own husbands and husbands to their own wives. Let her see these verses are a package deal. They cannot be held in isolation. If you love verse 18, but you reject verse 19, you are out of step with Jesus. If you say women, a wife should submit to her husband when you're not loving your wife as Christ loved the church, you are out of step with Jesus. And just in case you're wondering, that's actually a really big deal to be out of step with Jesus. Okay. Likewise, if you love verse 19, but you reject verse 18, you also are out of step with Jesus. The same Lord commands wives to submit to their husbands and husbands to love their wives. They're a package deal. Letter D, these verses don't say anything about marriage being easy. Hard is in the marriage equation. After 30 plus years of being married myself and 28 years of pastoral ministry and observing hundreds of people, I can tell you definitively there's marriage and easy are not the same. They're, they don't, that's just not it, right? Hard is a part of the equation. Now, thankfully, we do have somewhat of a say as to where hard goes in the equation. So we can be selfish and we can be passive about God's order and we will have a hard marriage. The inverse of that, we could be selfless and work hard at actively applying God's principles to our marriage and have a fulfilling marriage. The real tough one is when one spouse is striving to honor God and the other one's a coward or is lazy. That's the real tough one. And for you, if that's you, I, I pray for grace. Letter E in these general principles, these verses are commands from God. It is God, not the husband, who commands the wife to submit. And it is God, not the wife, who commands the husband to love. And each will give an account to God of their obedience to the command given specifically to them, regardless of their spouse's obedience. The two pillars of marriage then that are in place now that we've got these general principles are first, wives who submit to their husbands. This is a pillar of marriage. It is what God has ordered in the home. To submit means to willingly yield to another, uh, the, the authority of another, to willingly yield to the authority of another. Wives who submit to their husbands, a pillar of marriage. Now in our day, friends, that might be one of the most abrasive um, statements that could be made. Our culture has so twisted that concept up and taken what was, what is beautiful and made it ugly. The perfect picture of this, friends, is the relationship between the divine Son of God and His Father. The Father and the Son are equal. It is one of the most fundamental doctrinal statements of the Christian church from the beginning. That the Father and the Son are equal, but the Son willingly yields to the Father. And in turn, the Father loves and honors 
the Son above all else. That's the beauty of what is handed down to our homes where wives willingly yield to the authority of their husbands and husbands love and honor their wives above all else. This command to submit is based on God's creation order in which husbands who were created first were given a leadership role in the marriage and in the family for the purpose of guiding and guarding and providing for their families. This is what the Bible calls headship. Headship is delegated authority from God to the man and he is to exercise that authority for the good of those over whom it is being exercised. It is never supposed to be exercised for self-service. Marriage itself in the Bible is presented as a metaphor of the relationship that exists between Jesus Christ and the family of God, the church, wherein Christ is the head and the church is the body of Christ. Enough of this nonsense that comes out of Hollywood that rejects headship, or even if it does mention headship, then says, yeah, but the wife is the neck that turns the head. That's nonsense, friends. It's super unbiblical. In fact, I think it's offensive to God. It would be equivalent to saying Jesus is the head of the church, but the church is the neck that turns the head. Nobody in their right mind who fears God would say that. But marriage itself is a metaphor for that picture. Part of the evidence that a married woman is following Jesus is that she's submitting to her husband in a Christ-like manner. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is husbands who love their wives. Love here is that Greek word agape, which is defined as a demonstrably affectionate and loyal love. That's a mouthful, but it's powerful. A demonstrably affectionate and loyal love based on the regarded value of the object of the love. For the husband, the object of his love is his wife, and she is regarded of the highest value, and so he demonstrates his affection and his loyalty to her in loves, in love. Husbands are to love in a way that reflects the needs of their wives over their own needs and certainly over their own preferences. When we do that, Men, we are beginning to understand what God has called us to. The text says, husbands, love your wives, and then adds this, and do not be harsh with them. That's a commandment, friends. A husband who uses his greater strength or his louder voice in a way that suppresses or dominates his wife, has committed a grave sin against his wife and against God. And the right response would to be on your knees begging for God and your wife to forgive you. Do not be harsh. You have misinterpreted entirely what it means to be a husband if you're harsh with your wife. Husbands, if you attempt to abdicate your headship, the leadership role that God has delegated to you, you also have committed a grave sin against God and against your wife. The Bible says husbands are the head of their wives as Christ is the head of the church. It's not negotiable. You are the head. You can be a bad one or you can be a good one or somewhere in between, but getting rid of headship on the part of a husband isn't even possible. So, If you have abdicated that responsibility and your wife is the functional head of your household, you need to repent. 
to your wife and to God and order your home properly. I know some of you are sitting here thinking, I didn't know I was getting into this this morning. But let's take it, if we can, with grace from the Word of God. Because as it is true that part of the evidence of a married woman following Jesus being that she's submitting to her husband, so it is part of the evidence that a married man is following Jesus, that is loving his wife in a Christ-like manner also. These are the two, these are the two pillars of marriage, friends, that must be in place in an ordered home. And an ordered home is normal for the Christ follower. Now let's move on to the family. The two virtues of family are to be esteemed. And here we're told that children are to obey their parents and parents are to encourage their children. First, verse 21, uh, verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, it says, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Children who obey their parents are helping keep the family as a cohesive unit. The family is to be esteemed, friends. It is the fundamental building block of any sort of just and civil society. Children obeying their parents is part of that. And I would use the definition of children here to include teenagers. Children would be any minor who lives with their parents. They're to obey their parents in everything, for it pleases the Lord. Adults who still live in their parents' home might wonder whether or not this is applicable to them. My counsel, this text does not deal with that, but my counsel would be, you should be careful and smart and mature. Maybe you could argue that obeying your parents at that moment isn't applicable to you, but honoring your parents most certainly still is, which is the commandment. The other thing that would be wise, maybe empowering to parents and a check to adult children who still live in home is to realize that when you live at home as an adult, that's a privilege, not a right. So if you want it your way, it might be best for you to move on and stand on your own two feet. Grow up. God expects children to carry out the expectations of their parents. Both parents, as we notice, both parents hold authority over their children. Children, obey your parents. Both parents should be in agreement then. If both parents are to be obeyed, they can't say different things to the kids. There can't be varying expectations, one from the dad and one from the mom. That's a recipe for a free-for-all. It is the duty of parents to establish and to enforce the boundaries for behavior. To obey one's parents as a child is to obey God, and it is pleasing to God. So long as what the parents expect is within the confines of the laws of God and does not ask their children to violate the laws of God in any way, the children are to obey their parents. So parents need to be smart about what they're asking of their children. That authority must be used wisely and properly. Stages of maturity must be taken into account. If what you expected of your 10-year-old hasn't changed now that your child is 16, You need to reevaluate the expectations. The child who does not learn how to obey his or her parents while living at home will have have a difficult time in all of life and they often won't realize why. It's because they never learned how to obey their parents. Part of the evidence that a child is following Jesus is that he or she is obeying their parents. The second virtue here, as we go in the order that the text gives us, is parents who encourage their children. Now we see in verse 21 that fathers are singled out. I think they're singled out for, I see two kind of uh, 
two reasons, I think. The first is the assumed standard that the father is in the lead because he's the head of the home. And then he and his wife together labor to bring up their children. The other thing, the other reason I think that fathers are singled out is because it is far more in the nature of a man to wrongly provoke their children than is that of a mother. Mothers are more naturally nurturers and fathers need to, I think at times, be commanded to not do dumb things. We notice that the command is actually given in the negative. I've stated the principle in the positive. Parents who encourage their children is a virtue. But the command is given in the negative. Do not provoke your children. The reason is we're told that they will be discouraged. It's a powerful word. It means to lose heart or to be demoralized. Again, I think that fathers because of their headship role, need to be very careful how they exercise that authority because a lot of kids have been demoralized by a domineering father. We need to order our homes. Provocation through criticism or a lack of reasonable freedoms, or harsh punishments, or shaming, or teasing, or just being regularly grouchy and always saying no is not the atmosphere that you want in your homes. That's not an ordered home, friends. Rather, parents need to put courage into their children by spending time with them and listening to them and being interested in them and showing affection and affirming them as valuable people, praising good behavior and carefully disciplining as necessary. Part of the evidence that a parent is following Jesus is they're encouraging and not discouraging their children. So these are the two values or virtues of family that are to be esteemed. While this text is very pointed, and I recognize that my passion and zeal may for some of you feel a little bit overbearing, I don't mean it like that. I just care about the quality of life in my own home and in your homes and want very much for us to experience the blessing of working at getting this right because the cost of not getting it right is higher than most people calculate. It's not a free-for-all, friends where we just get to do whatever we want to do, we will reap the rewards of that nonsense if we do. There is a particular order that God has designed for our homes. It is to our advantage to work at getting the order right. And we can. By the power of we can, we, can, we can, by the power of God's Spirit at work within us as we take the principles of God's Word and strive to apply them, we can improve. We can see transformation. I've got a number of recommendations. Some of you might want to grab your pens. I'm going to give those to you in just a moment. But let's look to application here. Which part or parts are out of order in your home? Think about those two pillars of marriage and the two virtues of family. Which part or parts are out of order in your home? Then you've got to figure out which, if it's out of order, is it within your power to do something about it? 
teenagers who are hearing this message, if you see dysfunction in your parents' marriage, no marriage is perfect, but if you see true dysfunction, it's not likely that it's within your power to change that. And that deep-seated discontent that you feel that comes out in depression or rage, even if you're not expressing those things outwardly, I would, I would just really encourage you to lean into Jesus. Cast your cares, cast those cares upon him because he does care for you and he will help you shoulder that. It's not probably within your power to positively affect that other than to do your part to obey your parents, to honor them, even when you see imperfections in them. The last thing you want to do as a husband is to walk away from this message with a list of things that you'd like to talk with your wife about that she needs to work on. Not smart. Likewise, it's not smart if as a wife, all you did was think of the things that your husband falls short in so that now you can needle him and try to manipulate him into being who he's supposed to be. Not smart. What can you do about yourself here in ordering the home? And here's what I would really challenge you, and I know this is, this is going to make somebody, some, some of you really uncomfortable. But I want to encourage you to talk together as a family, to sit down together. In as much as your family is, if it's just a husband and a wife, sit down together. If you've got children still in the home, sit down together. Talk to the members of your household. Apologize where necessary and pray for each other. Like literally before the sun goes down today, and here's, here's my real challenge. Husbands, you're the one that's supposed to lead the way on this. Don't wait for your wife to say, oh, remember, we were supposed to do this. Lead well. I'd like to pray for us. And then I'll give some recommendations. Father, as we bow before you this day, um, we thank you that you are true, that you have ordered our homes in a way that is for your honor and for our good. The relationship between husbands and wives and wives and husbands and children and their parents and parents and their children. Lord, we want to get it right. And I pray for those, Lord, who hear this morning, or who are hearing things that are hard to hear because maybe their things aren't right. Their home isn't ordered as it should be. Thank you for grace, Lord. Thank you for mercy and forgiveness and for patience. You'd call us to put on patience and compassionate hearts and kindness for one another. And Lord, thank you that you are compassionate and kind and patient with us. Help us, Lord, to not feel as if we have failed, but that we need to grow and change. So give us grace, Lord, to grow and to change. May we take your word in humility and by your spirit strive to live it out. And if you can say amen to that, say amen. Okay, a couple of recommendations. Uh, first on marriage, I've got two books I want to recommend. The first is called Love and Respect. It's been around for a long time. Emerson Egerix is the author. That is a foundational book to help you as a husband and as a wife understand what this relationship should look like. It's a very powerful book. The second one is called I Still Do by Dave Harvey. And that is for those who've been married for a while who have the fundamentals at least understood and are practicing them, but 
for those who've been married for quite some time, as we all know, the pizzazz uh, sometimes wanes, the excitement sometimes fades, and yet we have, we, we're committed and we love and we need to remember that we still do. Um, so that'd be one for, uh, for those who've been married for a bit. On the parenting side, I want to encourage you, Boundaries with Kids by Drs. Henry Cloud and Don, uh, John Townsend are, that's a tremendous book. Boundaries with Kids. The second one is called Parenting by Paul David Tripp. The other recommendation I would give to you parents who have teenagers is this Wednesday night at 6.30, we've got uh, our City Point Student Ministries Parent Night where the parents of teenagers get together, share a meal, encourage one another, probably share some war stories, um, and really try to be a support and build up. It's a great way to make some friends Build, develop some relationships with other parents. For children and teens, there's two books I would recommend. First is So You're About to Become a Teenager by Dennis Rainey. That's a great book to help parents talk through with their to-be teens of the things that they're about to face in life, some of which, unfortunately, even though they're not yet teens, they've already been inundated with through their schools and neighborhoods. The other one is This Changes Everything, How the Gospel Transforms the Teen Years by Jacqueline Crow. Recommend that book for those of you who have teenagers, uh, for those of you who are teenagers. And the last one here would be our, our upcoming City Point Student Ministries Winter Camp. If you are a, a parent of a teenager, do everything within your power to get your kids to camp, get your teens to camp. Sometimes as parents, we fail to prioritize, and I know that's a strong word, but we fail to prioritize in that we'll move heaven and earth to make sure our kids can go to a sporting camp, but then we can find nearly a half a dozen excuses as to why we wouldn't send them to a camp where their relationship with Christ would be nurtured in a beautiful way and in a powerful way. Get your kids to camp, right? All right. This concludes our Be Normal series. And I'm going to say for now, because I, th I think there's a few, thing few other things along the way that we might want to visit because things are so abnormal in our culture. We need to be reminded of what normal is. So this might be coming back at some point. But for now, be normal. Cultivate community. Tend your soul. Get in rhythm. Brace yourself and order your home. Let's stand together and sing one final song.